This next example is taken from The World Open in Philadelphia in 1994. My opponent is a very strong grandmaster named Alex Shabalov. I was just 17 years old at the time we played this game, and so, of course, I had tremendous respect for Shabalov. He's a very interesting man, um, one of the most exciting chess players, maybe the most exciting chess player in America. He's from Latvia, and he plays actually in a very similar style to Shirov, who's the greatest player to come from Latvia today. Shabalov is very, very exciting. He's sacrificial. He has a, a love for the unknown. He'll make things completely wild just for the love of playing wild positions. He's a joy to study, a joy to play against. He and I actually spent three or four days working together in New York a couple of years ago, and it was very interesting to feel his attacking spirit up close. So we reached this position in Philadelphia, and it was just after time control. We were on the 41st move. I have the white pieces. You can see that I'm up a pawn. He has a little bit of compensation because my pawns are locked down to squares f4, g5, h6 of the same color of my bishop. But my pawn at h6 is a very dangerous one. If I can activate my rook after the h7 weakness, I should be able to win. On the other hand, black does have some compensation. He's pressuring the d3 pawn. He can play knight d5, which is a very strong place for the knight. Attacking my bishop, if my bishop moves, the pawn at f4 goes. Black's game is fine. Here he made a move which is completely in his style, e5. And we reached a position where things were very, very unusual. Typically, a rook and bishop are stronger than a rook and knight. Here's a position where white's going to be up two pawns with a rook and bishop, except the rook and knight have compensation. This is the unknown. This is completely atypical chess, but very, very interesting. Shabalov has the unique ability to understand the subtle nuances of positions of compensation better than virtually any player I know. After e5, I played f takes e5. He played f4. This was his idea. Now, bishop takes f4 would be a mistake because he plays knight takes d3 check, and that's a fork. My king is cut off by his rook. I can't defend my bishop, and if I move to g2, he can take my bishop checking and defending his rook. So I can't do that. But after f4, what I do have is the very strong move bishop d4. Now, if he plays knight takes d3, I can just move my king, and I'll be up a pawn. His idea was to maintain the pressure with king e6. He wants to blockade my pawn on e5, which locks in my bishop on d4. And his plan is to have the d5 square for his knight. With his king on e6, I can't push my central pawns. And he wants to take advantage of the light squares. A knight on d5, a king on f5. My g5 pawn is now under attack. If he gets this, then he can play king to g4, threatening rook h2 check, preparing rook f3 check. With a knight, a pawn on f4, king on g4, rook on h3, control of the light squares, he wants to build up a big attack in the endgame. A very, very interesting, unique, profound idea. I had a very strong idea if he had played rook h2 check instead of king e6, because most people would want to play rook h2, forcing me to defend my rook and then trying to win the exchange. But it's impossible. After rook h2 check, what I had in mind was king e1, and after knight c2 check, which might seem quite strong, if I move my king, he wins my bishop, white is winning. I play rook takes c2, rook takes c2, e6 check. My pawns can't really be stopped. If he takes on e6, then I would play g6. Obviously, my next move will be g takes h7 and making a queen. He plays rook h2. I do just that. g takes, after rook takes h6, he can't stop me from queening. His king can't get back. If he takes the pawn, h takes g6, then after h7, I make a queen. And if he tries to defend with rook c7, you see what I play with white? I win easily after bishop g7, blocking his rook's defensive h7. My next move will be to take his pawn and queen. If he plays h takes g6, I play h7 make a queen next, and I win the game. So take a look at this position again and work out the complexities on your own. White is winning. There's no way for black to stop things. If he tries king g6 instead of king takes e6, then after e7, rook c8, I play bishop f6. Now all of my pawns are locked in. His rook and king have to hold on to things defending. And this position is winning for white. My bishop is rock solid on f6. My e7 pawn is defended. He has to deal with the e8 queening square. If he tries to do it with the king, after king f7, then I can just play the move d4. Now one plan of mine is to play d5, d6, d7, make a queen. And the point is that if his rook ever moves off of the 8th rank, say by playing rook c7, planning rook d7, to try to take my pawn if I move to d5, then I have the move g6 check. He has to deal with it. He can't take with the king because I make a queen. If he takes my bishop, I also make a queen. And if he takes with the pawn, then I can play h7, and he can't stop that one. White wins. If black doesn't leave the 8th rank with his rook, then it's pretty straightforward. I can at will play king f2 to f3. I can take his pawn. 
I don't really even need to do that. I can always play d5, d6, d7. White can improve his position as quickly or slowly as he wants to. Black can't do anything, and white will win very easily. So rook h2 was impossible. If he tried knight takes d3, then after king e2, I would just be up a pawn with a much better game with white. He played king e6, playing for the initiative. I moved off the check and square d3, king g1. He played knight c6, bishop b2. And now he played knight e7. He wants to have complete control of the light squares. Now g6, I can never be played because he controls it with the knight. d5 and f5 are completely controlled by black. And we see a very, very unusual chess position. White is up two pawns with a rook and bishop against a rook and knight. And yet in some strange way, black seems to be the guy pressuring. Psychology is at the very forefront of a position like this. And you have to think about what it's like to play against a guy like Shabalov. Take into consideration I was 17 years old. I was a young player. I obviously had a lot of respect for him. And you also go into this kind of game expecting for the strong grandmaster of this style to dictate the style of the game. I knew at one point that he was going to make things crazy, and here he did. The question is whether I'm able to keep my cool head, keep my confidence, and take advantage of the little mistakes. So here, of course, White's position is objectively fine. Let's see how I handled it. d4, and he went on with his blockade, king d5. Very interesting plan. You can feel the creativity of Shabalov's style here. It takes quite a player to come up with this idea. The knight on e7 holds f5 and g6. The king is on d5. He plans king e4 to e3, maybe f3, build up an attack. I have to be quite careful. So king d5, I played rook e2, stopping his king from coming in any further. He played f3. What would you do? Of course, when you're a head material, you want to trade off. f3 does push the pawn down the board, but it has a serious drawback, which is that it blocks his rook off from the d3 square and from actual escape if I try to trade it off. Here I played the very strong rook h2, forcing him to trade, because if he tries rook g3 check, then after king f2, when he takes on g5, and I take on f3, I'll have unwound my position, my king is active now, and my two central pawns should definitely tell, and I should win. Resilient as he is, Shabala figured out a way to maintain his pressure even after the rooks come off the board. He played rook takes h2, king takes h2, and king e4. To understand this competitive situation fully, you have to take into consideration the emotion of the game, how it felt. We're in a big playing hall. The room was a little bit chilly. We're in the fifth hour of the struggle. We've both been putting our hearts in the line for a long time. A lot of people are watching. There's always a little bit of nervousness in big games. The World Open is a very, very important tournament every year. So the stakes are pretty high. I'm playing against a very strong grandmaster, and I'm a young guy. I'm 17 years old. To win this game would be huge, and I'm up two pawns in an endgame. On the other hand, my opponent is playing very confidently. Even though I'm up two pawns, even though all my chess sense says that he shouldn't have full compensation, I'm playing a grandmaster who's playing with tremendous confidence, or at least he's projecting tremendous confidence, which is a very big part of being a grandmaster, being a good psychologist. So in this type of situation... I can approach it two ways. I can have complete belief in my own position, or I can be wary, looking at it, wondering, what does he have in mind? What is his idea? What does he see that I don't see? Because a very strong grandmaster will often see things that you don't see. Thinking about who your opponent is, how strong your opponent is, whether your opponent sees things that you don't, that can always lead to problems. It can make you see ghosts where there are none. This position is, in fact, excellent for white. But I was a little bit more tentative in my judgment of this position than I would have been if I had been playing somebody who was around my rating. And this little inkling of caution cost me in the game. Let's look at how. I played king g1. He played king e3. Very aggressive. His next two moves will be king e2 and f2. I played king f1, stopping it. If I can succeed in completely locking down all of black's play, then my central pawn should be able to flow. He played f2. White to move. What do you do? Separate yourself from all the discussion of the game. Pretend we're not playing against Shabalov. Pretend we're looking at a tactics book. You have the white pieces. White to move. How do you handle it? Calculate deeply. Here I played a decisive mistake, letting him back in the game. G6. This game is one in which I didn't handle the madness as well as I could have. My point is that if he plays knight f5... Then after bishop c1 check, king f3, I have the very strong move bishop f4. I stop his attempt to mate me, and after king takes f4, 
king takes f2, there's no way for black to defend all of my threats. If he plays h takes g6, I play h7, and he can't stop the queen. If he plays knight takes h6, then I can play g takes h7, and then after he plays knight f7, stopping the queening square, I can play e6, and after knight h8, e7, and I win the game. This was my idea. After bishop f4, black's counterplay is frozen, and white wins the game. But he has something else. He played simply knight takes g6, and after bishop c1 check, I have to get him off the f2 square, king takes d4, e6, king d5, suddenly my advantage slips away, king takes f2, king takes e6, and after king f3 we agreed to a draw, it's even material again, no one can win, and we drew the game. Let's go back a few moves. I'm sure you can feel from my decision to play g6 that I was a little bit thrown off by his aggression. My position seems very, very good, but still he's playing with such a confidence, he's going at me, that I found a way to respond to his most aggressive continuation. After g6, if he plays knight f5, as I showed you, bishop c1 check, king f3, bishop f4, locks down his attack, and I win. But I failed to think about his cautious idea, his simple knight takes g6, which can draw the game by force for black. If I had been a little bit more clear-headed, I would have found the forced win. Take some time and you find it. Reverse the move order. The correct move is bishop c1 check first. If he plays king f3, then I can play g6. As we know, knight f5, bishop f4 wins the game. And after knight takes g6, do you see what I play with white? Bishop g5 is very strong, threatening e6 and e7, controlling the e7 square. Black has to play king g4, attacking my bishop. I play bishop d8, still controlling e7. Now, if he plays king f5, I can just take on f2, and I'm up two pawns and winning. And if black tries knight f4, then after king takes f2, knight e6, forking my bishop on d8, my pawn on d4, the idea of playing d5, knight takes d8, e6 doesn't work, because he can defend with knight b7 to d6. But I can simply play bishop f6, and after knight takes d4, I bring my king into the game with a crucial tempo, king e3. And if knight e6, then king e4. And my king activity and extra pawn will win the game. Next will be king d5. And if he defends with his king on f5, I can gradually move my king over to the queen side and pick off the a and b pawns. This is winning for white. So you see that if I had played bishop c1 check, after king f3, g6 wins the game. If after bishop c1 he plays king takes d4, then I play the very strong move e6. Now that his king is separated from the f2 square, I'm safe to push in the center. He doesn't have time to develop any mating attack with king f3, knight f5. If he plays king e5, then I could simply play bishop a3. If he takes on e6, then I win by taking on e7. King takes e7. King takes f2. King e6. King g3. And after king f5, I can defend my pawn with king h4. His only move is king g6, because of course after king f4, I can play g6 and win. Then I can play king g4, and I push him back and win the game easily with white. The way you win this type of position, I should mention, is that after king f7, I would play king f5, king g8, I can play king f6. If he plays king f8, I can play then g6. And then after h takes, I can play h7. And even if he were to succeed in making me make a trade, h pawn for g pawn, and I would be unable to push on the king side, I can always run my king over to the queen side, let him win my king side pawn, pick up his queen side pawns, and win the game. So king takes e6 loses to bishop takes e7. And after knight d5, I can play e7. And after knight c7, do you see how I win? Simply g6, and I win on the king side. Black can't stop the queening of the h-pawn. So finally, after we see that king e5, bishop a3 wins for white, black's last possible chance would be to play knight f5. But now we can win once again by playing the break g6. It's very important that black had the possibility of defending my kingside pawns and my central pawn from the same two-square hopping post. e7 to g6 stops both. After he moves to f5, then I can play g6. And if he takes it, I push. There's no way for black to defend against my h and g pawns and my e pawn. Work it out for yourself and make sure that you agree. So you see, this was the critical moment. I had two choices. I played g6, the wrong move order, and gave him the possibility of the simple continuation, knight takes g6, forcing a draw. If I had been a little bit more clear-headed, I would have found bishop c1 check. This is not a very difficult move. And it's a type of solution which I would find usually without much difficulty at all. 
What held me back was the mounting sense of uncertainty, the fact that a very strong grandmaster had done something very unusual against me. We were in a strange position. I didn't trust myself enough. So believe in yourself and learn from your mistakes. If you find yourself having difficulty in unusual positions, then play a lot of them so that you get more comfortable. Always take yourself on.